a mutually owned life insurance company pays dividends and you benefit as a policy owner from those dividends. So I got a guaranteed minimum rate of return on my money and I get dividends on my money. And so now when I borrow that $25,000, i am still getting both of those, the dividends and the guaranteed rate on the entire $50,000 while I'm taking my other $25,000 to put on a, uh, you know, a real estate project, start my business or whatever. <laughs> Welcome to another installment of the Perspective Podcast. My name is Devin. I have my co-host with me here, Mitch Harley. And today we have on the show Milton E. Brown Jr., a financial services expert, to talk about why the uh, the idea of retirement and our old systems are failing us now and what we can do about it. So to kick things off, Milton, I'm going to throw you the mic. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of give us a little bit of a background on how you landed in the world of financial services. Absolutely. First of all, I just want to thank both of you gentlemen, Devin and Mitch, for giving me the, the platform and the opportunity to uh, talk with you guys today. I truly appreciate it. Um, I got into financial services really out of a personal um, selfish reason, if you will. And that was the fact that I grew up uh, in a single parent household and, you know, struggling, you know, the traditional racks to riches story, so to speak, or a single family household, uh, government assistance program, so on and so forth. And understood that there has to be a systematic way or a method in which to get out of this current situation that I was in. I uh, attended um, DePaul University here in Chicago, and I saw many people in my family get a job, and it just seemed like their life never really got any better. So I decided that I wanted to understand the money game and how it works, right? Because I truly, even to the day, feel like, you know, finances is truly a, a, a money game. And you have to understand the rules of the game in order to win. If you don't, you just continue to go around the board and around the board, or as we know today, the rat race, right? And so there's a way to get out of the rat race, but you have to learn the rules and the techniques on how to do so. So uh, going back, I got into financial services by way of A.L. Williams, which uh, if you're not familiar with A.L. Williams, it is the you know, current Primerica, which is a multi-level marketing financial service company. And when I got involved, again, my mission was to understand and learn how money works, right? Uh, I wanted to learn about mutual funds and investing and how to choose stocks and, you know, all of those great things. And as I indicated, A.L. Williams, which is currently Primerica, was uh, a multi-level marketing company. So while, where the primary focus was recruiting, I thought it was actually learning about finances. And so when I went to the different classes, I noticed that it was all about how to approach people, how to start the conversation, how to follow up. But it wasn't approaching people to talk about finances. It was about trying to get them to come into the business. So I know I, I learned very quickly that this is just all about multi-level marketing and recruiting. And so I left that after uh, acquiring my licenses, I left there and just became an independent agent. So I was out here just kind of a gunslinger on my own trying to figure it out. Uh, I had, you know, a, a, a moderate level of success, but I realized in order to really be effective and again, achieve my original goal, which was to understand how money worked, I needed to go to uh, one of the major institutions, whether it was, um, you know, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Northwestern Mutual, someone who could really teach me how it worked. So I interviewed with several um firms. And I ended up working with New York Life, uh, one of the premier life insurance companies in the country and uh, have a great training program. I learned a tremendous amount through their program. I was with New York Life for about four years. My first year and a half had, you know, tremendous set and I got lured, and I'll stress lured into management, right? Oh, you're doing so awesome. You're, gross, you're doing so well. You can help other agents. Now, with New York Life, unlike other you know, firms, you're not allowed to write your own business. As a manager, your primary focus is to recruit and train and develop. And a large portion of your compensation is based on how well your team does. And so, um, long story short, uh, I guess I didn't recruit too well because the production was not there. And I ended up going back into the field as an agent after a year um, because the production just wasn't there to, you know, sustain the, the quality of life that I had become accustomed to. I was like, 
these guys are not doing it. I can do better on my own. So I went back to the field as an agent and, you know, continued with New York Life for a while. And then one of my colleagues at New York Life and I, we branched out and started our own firm and started our own practice. And um, we did, you know, very well. Again, I had one particular client who was extremely successful, sold the business. And I said, hey, you know, I'm always looking for other opportunities to invest my money. You come up with another business idea, let me know, you know, and I would like to be a part. Long story short, he did come back to, it, to me with an offer. We got in business together. At the time, it was email marketing business. And that business went on for about uh, 10 years. And so I was able to really see a different side on the entrepreneur side and still maintain my practice because I had a partner. And so um, that went well until COVID. And that's when I decided that I need to delve back 100% full time into financial services because it was a passion. So that was, that's a quick story of where I've been, the journey along the way, and where I am now. And I got, I got so much on this. So definitely, I'm going to let you start the question here because I'm going to start nerding out in a minute too. Okay. So I'm going <laughs> to kick the ball in one direction. Hopefully, you guys can, can run with this one. Um, Right from the beginning, you went through what I think is a really familiar experience for a lot of people who have experimented in the entrepreneurial world, uh, which is the the multi-level marketing business. Uh, I, yeah. too, was a victim of Primerica. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. uh, and a couple others. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Um, I got sucked into another one with uh, my ex-wife. We, she was doing... Uh, um, I can't even remember it was makeup or something like that or supplements or it was a thing. And so there, there's, but, but you're right. There's a lot of, um, a lot of emphasis on the recruitment of things. And now to have that echo in the, in, in your future work, uh, yeah. when you were a part of a, the bigger firm there that to see that that's what their primary uh, goal is. It, it just, I think it highlights a big problem with this industry which is yes. the, the turnover of the, yes. the amount of people that come into it with this idea of like actually genuinely wanting to help maybe first themselves, but obviously when the plane's going down, put your own mask on and then you can help other people. I'm a huge proponent of that idea. So right. somewhere along the journey, you went, you know what? Recruiting isn't where I'm at. I'm trying to serve people with something really, really specific. Uh, can yes. you talk to that a little bit? What was that experience like for you? So... <sighs> Doing well for myself, the management really convinced me of, full disclosure, the compensation plan was phenomenal. Mm. And it's like, you can go out and do all this work yourself and make this amount of money, or you build your team and you just train and develop them. And then you can, you know, become, you know, you, you continue to get promoted and now you're over an entire area and all this other kind of stuff. And so I kind of bought into that vision of, hey, I do now understand how the money game work. Money game work. Now I'll just have more fuel to throw on the fire in terms of cash to really play the game, right? And so, and then the other thing that they sold me on with, and then you can help other agents, you know, who are new, and you can help them develop. So that tugged at my heart too, because in my previous life, I was in social service, you know, in the social service arena, working with DCFS wards of the state you know, kids who didn't have a home or whatever. And so the idea of helping someone else sound great to me. Why be selfish? I know how to do this. Let's help others. So I got stuck into the compensation and, you know, the idea that I can help develop other individuals, you know, change their lives as well. Um, but then things kind of went awry when they didn't have either the zeal or the whatever, the, the motivation to go out and make things happen. Because as you know, whether it's makeup or supplements or financial services, you have to have some get up and go about you in, in order to go out and get clients. And it's no, it doesn't help to, to know everything and have all this knowledge if there's no one to talk to. So um, I, I, I guess I didn't do very well in terms of recruiting the right people to the industry. Um, and, and that's what you know, caused me to say, hey, I, can do, I can't do this. I know what I can do. I can be responsible for myself and I can get back to helping people. And so that's end up what I did. I think that's really valuable for, for a lot of people to hear that 
Yes, maybe the emphasis is, uh, yeah, you got to get on the phone, you got to do this, you got to do that. I know Alex Hermosi is one of the, his biggest, uh, like most viral videos was him talking about if you were to get on the phone and make 100 calls every single day, you'd be in a completely different place, you know, between here and, a, a, you know, let's say 100 days from now. And mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds easy. But the reality is, is that some people just don't have the skills to do that thing. And so recognizing that in yourself and allowing yourself to walk away from this opportunity to go pursue something that really actually did have meaning and um, importance to you, I think says a lot uh, to, to somebody else who's stuck in that position of like, I don't want to do this part. I want to do this part. So somebody might just need that, um, I don't know, confirmation or uh, validation that it's okay to go back and you know what focus on what you're good at double down on that and and kind of minimize your exposure to the stuff that you're not so good at would you say that that's what you what you went through that's not only what i went that's definitely what i went through but another takeaway is know your language right let's let's look at michael jordan right debatably the debatable depending on how you feel about lebron but the best basketball player to play the game, right? So many think or, you know, stay. Um, but was he the best coach, though, when he was with the Wizards? Right? I mean, it's kind of like, ooh, you, you're not good at that thing, you know? You need to be on the court, but not, you know, running the bench. And so I think sometimes as entrepreneurs, because we're good at a specific skill set, you know, now we think that we can teach it or we can lead people. And you need to know where your strength lies and just really drill down in that strength. You know, oftentimes people are good at cooking and now they think that they can run a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Totally two different things, buddy. <laughs> totally two different things. You're an amazing chef, but stay in the kitchen. And then there's a whole business that needs to be operated out here at the front of the house. And so I think for me, um, I was allowed, I allowed someone to convince me to come out of the kitchen and go to the front of the house, which is where I, I should not have been. Yeah. I, I really resonate with that. I always had a, a saying that, you know, a biz proper businessman doesn't matter what he sells, right? Yeah. Like he, he could have a company selling socks or he could have a company selling architecture. It doesn't matter because the fundamentals of business and money are the same. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think because they make socks they can sell a, they can run a you know a big business more than just out of their home on etsy kind of thing um but i'm gonna go back to let's go back to the primerica thing because i have a um i feel like when you talk to people about multi-leveling multi-level marketing um there's even there's either this love or this hate and you have people that love it they don't care if they keep jumping ship to other to the next you know, best thing. They don't care. They like that structure and it works for them. And that's cool. Yeah. And then there's the people that bought into the Kool-Aid, drank it, failed because it didn't meet expectation. They didn't have realistic expectations and now they hate it and they think it's all scams. And I think that there's a happy middle ground mm -hmm. because I, I am not anti multi-level marketing. I think it has its place. I think that there are certain companies that run a very smart and effective way of doing it. I think there's companies that take that model and really, you know, don't do a good job. They don't support the people and they just look at, you know, kind of that flash in a pan sale. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I got in, I got all my licensing for the, for financial services as well. It wasn't through Primerica. It was from a competitor, but mm -hmm. you know, where, where I fell off, I felt that I was on a path of learning a lot. I learned an, an incredible amount about mortgages and investments, mutual funds, and, and all of that. Um, mm -hmm. what I didn't like was what you resonated with where the, the focus was about recruiting. And I'm like, well, we're still in this, let's be real. I'm, I'm not trying to put the veil over. We're still in the phase of recruiting me. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about how this actually works, the cogs and the wheels. And they were like, well, that's for when you get your license. And I'm like, Let's, let's put in the court course before the cart cart before the horse. Like, you know, I, I felt it very backwards. And so I stayed with it because I wanted that license. I wanted the training. I loved that part of it. But then what I found was, and you made a comment that you, regardless of how you felt about Primerica, regardless how you felt about, you know, New York life, all these other things, 
you had a passion for business. You had a passion for finances. And I didn't, right? I didn't have that passion. I liked it because I liked the information and I felt it would benefit me as an entrepreneur. So side note, I think anyone building a business, go get recruited by, you know, by one of these companies so you can understand the fundamentals and then go back to your business. But mm -hmm. what I saw was I just didn't have a passion and they saw this go-getter you know, excited pe person that can build relationships. And they're like, you know, you're going to do so well. You're going to rock it. We're going to help you do this. And in my mind, I'm like, I don't want to sell life insurance, right? It's just, it's not because I hate it. It's just not my passion. My passion is over here. And that disconnect almost grew us apart because they were like, well, this guy's not in, you know, he's not buying in. And I'm like, well, I would with a different product. Like I'm not, you know, it's just not here. So I think that there has to be a little bit of context there with the multi-level marketing because, you know, pyramid schemes are illegal. So, mm -hmm. you know, for everything to be a pyramid scheme, that would make, you know, 105 companies in the States illegal. They're not, yeah. right? They work. But it's just that some of them are a little bit, you know, more aggressive when it comes to others. They're like, I think, I think Amway is a classic example of, you know, borderline cult following who rock. Mm -hmm buy our product and then you qualify to be a part of the family and then you can build a team, but we're going to bankrupt you first. And, and maybe that's a little harsh, but that's how, how I see the reality of it. And I, I don't, you know, some of these companies are very aggressive like that. In the financial service, what kind of kept me in, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I think that this is an, an important stigma here. So other, if you take the multi-level out of it, you take Primerica, you put it aside and you just look at some of like the you know, Sun Life or, or whoever a big one is in, in kind of your area. It's kind of a similar structure. You come in as a low level agent and, you know, your boss or, you know, whoever is above you in that structure, they get a commission based off your sales. And as you grow in the company, you know, it's, it's borderline a multi-level marketing, except you just don't get the benefits. So what, where am I off there? What do you see there? The two, two things. Number one, before you can get the benefit of someone else, you have to prove yourself. I didn't come into New York Life and in 30 days make 100 sales and then all of a sudden they say, hey, go recruit somebody. No, it took me some time. I had to show consistency. I had to show you know, um, persistency, right? So I had to prove myself that I had the good, that I had what it took in order to train someone else. In multi-level marketing, as soon as you sign your agreement, they asking you, now who can you go and talk to and bring into the business? And you haven't even learned the bit, as you said, you get, they didn't even recruit you fully before they're trying to get you to recruit someone else. And for me, when I was doing it, it's kind of like, hey, come to this meeting and I'm trying to tell them, get people to come. And they're asking me questions. I don't even know the answer. I don't even know. Right. Let's go learn together. Well, when you go into whether it's Morgan Stanley or, 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 or Goldman Sachs, any of these, you first have to prove yourself. You have to learn what the hell you're talking about, right? You have to know your stuff before you can become a manager or, you know, a district manager or something. So that's the difference. The other thing is about the financial multi-level marketing program. I despise them. And this is why. I, by the way, I love multi-level marketing from the idea, the concept. Check this out. I put on a nice fly suit, right? And I put on a nice watch. I, I dress nice and I get up in front of the room and I just motivate people and I just tell them what kind of great life you could have. And then I'm off. And then I just, you know, the people get motivated. They go out, I make money. I mean, just the idea of it, the idea of it, I was like, that's kind of cool. And then I go to another town. I, I, I fly to your town and it's, hey guys, we got Milton Brown out of Chicago who's ripping it up. Now a superstar on stage, right? I mean, the, 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 the lifestyle to me, but I never achieved it, but it seems like it would be pretty great, right? The problem for me with that, with financial services is, would you ever have your doctor as part of an MLM? He, he got recruited like MLM, right? So financial services is not, it is not oil. It's not makeup. It's not a nutrition bar. This is crucial to your life, just like your health, right? This is really important. So the person that is talking to me about my finances, I need to know that you really know what you're talking about. You qualify. You're not a financial advisor part-time and then a, a, a garbage man during the day. 
or you're a beautician during the day and you're selling me life insurance at nighttime. This is too important, right? So what I what I hate about it is that they approach financial services without the respect that it deserves because it's you are trusting me with your financial future when you sit down with me. You're trusting that I know what I'm doing. You know what I know what I'm talking about, and I'm going to lead you in the right direction. Well, how much study and 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 practice do I have when during this day I'm a school teacher? Right, right. So I just feel, and to that extent, I'm not a fan of multi-level marketing in the financial service space only. Other venues, right. in other venues, I love it, but in financial services. No, I, I like that. I like that perspective. I think it's a very healthy, balanced perspective. And I think it's so let's let's take all of that. And can we kind of shift now into what you see when it comes to our audience, especially whether we're talking entrepreneurs or just even just people in general? What are you seeing as some major changes, mistakes, something that like your that you if you had a message and soundboard and we could promise you 10 billion views, you know what? What would be the the Milne Brown message to people that we can kind of dive into for the next little bit? So it, it, it's levels, right? So the first thing is, if you are a brand new entrepreneur and you still have a nine to five, I say, keep your nine to five. Keep your nine to five and work your business. And, and, and that way you can reinvest all the profits of your business back into your business. The number one way to grow your business, of course, other than sales, right? is to be able to have the funding to keep putting into it to make it grow, to buy the infrastructure, whether it's staff, uh, the resources, uh, whether they, whether it's um, inventory, whether it's marketing on Facebook. But you need to be able to reinvest your money. And I think, unfortunately, many times entrepreneurs quit their job, their guaranteed income before they, sh- before they should. And now they're really in a panic because they got to make enough money to take care of their lifestyle and try to put money in the business. Now, when you have to choose between one or the other, do I increase my marketing budget or do I pay my bill? I think someone's paying my bill and now the business suffers, right? So that's number one. If someone hasn't already made the leap, I would say continue to hone the business, but keep that steady income so that you can take 100% of the profits of the business and reinvest it so it can continue to grow. That's number one. Now, beyond that point, you're in the business, you're full time. You're making your money. I think the, the the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out after you figure out all the aspects of running a business. You know your your KPIs, you know key performance indicators, and you understand you know what your marketing budget should be and what your profit margin and all that stuff. From a financial service perspective, I think you must make sure that you protect yourself. Our society is very litigious. Everybody wants to sue you. So you come up with something, uh, a lotion, and people put it on their hands, and all of a sudden they break out into a rash or something. Now you're being sued. You're personally liable for that. Even if you have a corporation, you still can be personally liable, and now your home and anything that you work for now is exposed to those lawsuits because you didn't properly protect yourself. So you have to think about asset protection, and the other thing is you have to think about the long game in terms of how do I prepare for retirement? I come across many entrepreneurs who, because they invest their money back in their business, as well as they're taking care of their lifestyle, they haven't properly prepared for retirement. And as an entrepreneur, we don't have a 401k or 403b, definitely don't have a pension. And so it's one of those things where you just bank on the fact that my retirement is the business. I'm going to sell the business and cash out good. Well, I'm going to tell you a true story that happened to a, gr- uh, a dear friend of mine. All of his money was vested into his business. And then, and, and at one point, the business was worth $20 million. And then the business went belly up. And so he went from owning a $20 million business to nothing. You don't have a business. You don't have any retirement. You have nothing. So now he has to start over, okay? And so my suggestion to any entrepreneur is you immediately want to sit down with a financial advisor and figure out how do you carve out a solo 401k? How do you carve out 
a Roth uh, IRA for yourself. And I stress Roth IRA because Roth IRA says, I want to invest after tax dollars because when my money grows, I don't want to have to pay taxes on it. Unfortunately, society teaches us or the system teaches us you want to defer taxes and defer taxes and defer taxes, pay them later. Okay, well, let's take a look at what's happening in the world right now. Is the United States national debt going up or down? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a clear downward angle. <laughs> and so how, how, how are they going to get the money to pay that from us? That's all they do. They just tax us all the time. And so after the, right now we're in a low, and it may not feel that way, but right now we're in a low tax uh, environment. When Donald Trump was in office in, in 2017, he did uh, something that he, redu he reduced the taxes for the middle class, lower middle class. Of course, he took care of those with the big pockets as well, but he reduced the tax bracket. That change is going to sunset or go away at the end of 2025. So become, uh, come January 2026, all the tax brackets can potentially go back up unless the current president decides to renew them. So in essence, you, we need to be paying as many taxes on our retirement accounts as possible now because you know, in the very near future, the taxes are going to be going up. Not many people know that. Not many people even think about that. We just like the immediate feel good of, I don't have to pay taxes. I don't have to pay taxes. What are you going to have to pay one day? Right? So let's pay the taxes now and then let's earn and grow our money. And all of it becomes ours in our retirement. And that's one of the things that I focus on with my clients is trying to make sure that when it comes to retirement, we have as much tax. Uh, tax-free income as possible. Yeah, ta tax uh, uh, deferring is not tax evasion. You're, you're, you're still paying the tax. You're <laughs> still going to pay the tax, buddy. Yeah, somebody somewhere is going to have to take pick up that tab, which I don't know. In interestingly enough, if you follow the the trail here, what what it seems like is like okay during your during your retirement, you're probably going to be paying a little bit of those taxes because you're taking money out of whatever savings plan thing that you have somewhere or wherever that tax haven was that you could defer the taxes for. So now you're going to be suffering in the in the longer run, not to mention the effects that inflation is going to have on that money and shrinking it and its buying power. And then on top of that, what happens when you kick the bucket and none of those taxes got paid or they weren't caught up fully? Well, who who picks up the tab on that? And so all you're doing is pushing the responsibility on to the people you care about the most. And so yes. wouldn't that be a bit of a, some form of inspiration to maybe uh, take some kind of action? So one would think, I mean, I, I'm so glad that you, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head, right? You, you not only looked at the effects of it to me immediately today, but the, the problem that I'm creating long term for those I love and care about because I didn't handle the business today. But unfortunately, again, what does our society tell us? The moment you get your job, they tell you, put money in your 401k, max it out, max it out, and then you get you an IRA, you know, and max it out, max it out, right? And all these vehicles that they tell us about, but it, was, it isn't until really recently you start hearing a little bit more about a Roth IRA, right? And then you have another tax-free uh, uh, vehicle, which is muni bond, which, you know, not many people know about, but you can get some muni bonds and they have some tax benefits long-term. But one of the greatest vehicles that help in retirement planning or tax-free retirement is one that many people just hate to hear it. They just, I mean, it, it, it's the worst word ever. Cash value life insurance. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I have a friend who, uh, actually, we, I helped start uh, a podcast for this whole group of people. Um, but they talk about whole life dividend paying insurance policies and the infinite banking concept and how um, if you if you o organize and structure things the right way, you yeah. take on the banking function. And I think there's something really um, really powerful to be to be had there. But but I do want to say this, Milton. I know for anybody that listens to this kind of stuff or or 
it tries to anyways what it, what ends up happening is it's like i just grabbed a hold of a fire hose and i'm trying to have a sip of water here and it's just too much I, my whole face gets blown off and i feel like my soul is <laughs> melting so what what would you do or what do you do i guess to to simplify this whole thing like what for anybody is there is there a clear starting point for somebody to to be able to be like okay let me let me put this fire hose on a water fountain and just go at my pace like for somebody like that who is afraid of all the jargon and all of these big words make no sense to us mm-hmm. where do we start so i s- several ways you can start my first suggestion is find you an advisor that you can connect with that you resonate with and you can say just that slow down Milton. That's too fast. I'm just trying to figure out what to do with this credit card bill right here. Right. Don't try to go and get the Morgan Stanley guy who has $3 million in, you know, under assets and all that stuff. Sometimes we get so caught up in names and who's who and instead of what's best for you. Right. So I tell people you cannot out invest or save credit card debt, right? I start with all of my clients with teaching them how to eliminate debt. So before we begin chasing 10% rates of return, 20% rates of return, all of that, I said, do you have credit card debt? Yes or no? Yes. Do you have a mortgage? Yes or no? Yes. The interest rate that you're paying on credit cards, and believe it or not, most people are not aware, and if you own a home or you know someone who does, ask to see the amortization table. That teaser rate of 3.99% mortgage rate is BS. It's marketing. When you look at your amortization table, it's simple as this. Your mortgage is $1,000. Year one through 10. How much of that thousand actually goes towards the principal? 200, 300. So that means you have eight, seven to $800 that's going towards what? Interest. So the real interest rate is a 70 or 80% interest rate. Right? Can you see that? Yeah, they just they, get they really clever. Front, right? They basically collect their interest up front to guarantee right. their profits. And then the exactly. who cares what happens to it? Exactly. And, and so they, so now I show clients how to get out of that trap as quickly as possible. Within nine to 10 years, I can show you how to get rid of credit card debt, mortgage debt, car loan debt, all of that within seven to 10 years. As long as you're making your monthly payments and you have $100 to $200, 100 to $200 more that you can contribute, I can show you how to eliminate all of that very quickly. The problem is that we get caught up on these, inch, these what we perceive to be low interest rates, and we just ride it out for 30 years. Well, if you look at your mortgage statement, it'll show you your $300,000 mortgage. When you're done, you're going to pay $620,000. That means you bought two houses. <laughs> you bought two homes, and you don't even think about it, right? Or these credit cards where you got 19%, 19.99, or even now, I've seen some clients with 29.99% interest on your credit card. And you're paying that on a monthly basis. Are you kidding me? And then you want to ask me, what can you invest your money in? You can invest it in that credit card. Because if I pay that credit, help you pay that credit card, I just, in essence, got you a 29% return on your money. Did I not? <laughs> right. You know? So I start there with my clients. I start with, let's get rid of your debt. And now let's take a look at what do you? What vehicles do you currently have in place for retirement? Um, what risk exposure do you have in terms of litigation and lawsuit to see how we need to protect your asset? And then I just go step by step, and I go slowly. That's a that's a great place to kick things off because I think debt is one of the things that most people understand. Most people understand, Absolutely. hey, I, times were bad. I needed a little bit of extra cash. I borrowed it, and now I can't pay it back. And it's getting bigger and scarier and bigger and scarier. And then, uh, with a with a a little bit of clever uh, planning and understand like a deep knowledge and understanding of the of the numbers, you make it possible for that monster to go away. So that's that's wonderful. So once 
once we get rid of the monster and it's no longer looming, okay, we're debt free, everything's good. Um, we're we're ready to start preparing for what it would look like to retire. What's the first step? So you you alluded to earlier, you were on a podcast with someone talking about the infinite banking concept. Yeah. I teach my clients the infinite banking concept. It has a multitude of benefits. The first is I use the infinite banking concept in order to help you pay off your debt. That's one. The second thing I do is I teach you how to become the bank. So you finance anything that you 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 need, right? Whether it's a car or starting your business or investing in real estate, you borrow it from yourself. You may already know this, but for those of your listeners who do not, when you use the infinite banking concept, if I have $50,000 inside of my bank, now I can borrow up to 95% of that 50,000. So let's just say I only took out 25,000. One would think I have $25,000 remaining. The reality is I still have 50,000 inside of my bank that's earning money two ways for me. It's earning a guaranteed rate of return from the insurance company, and it's going to benefit from the dividend. That's why it's important that you have your bank with a mutually owned life insurance company, because a mutually owned life insurance company pays dividends, and you benefit as a policy owner from those dividends. So I got a guaranteed minimum rate of return on my money, and I get dividends on my money. And so now when I borrow that $25,000, i am still getting both of those, the dividends and the guaranteed rate, on the entire $50,000 while I'm taking my other 25,000 to put on a uh, you know a real estate project, start my business or whatever. So I teach my clients after we get you out of debt, now let's take your bank and let's make some more money for you. Can you can you Cole's notes for us uh, a couple terms that get thrown around and and, and I'm specifically on these ones because of going back to the market multi-level marketing. They throw these terms out. They're kind of the big push when it comes to the the life insurance cash value, you know, you alluded to the the cash life insurance policy. There's universal whole life. And and you when you look at those three, I mean, I've personally seen benefits in all three of them, but mm-hmm. kind of define each one. And, and especially if we're gearing towards somebody that is a self-starter entrepreneur looking for long-term, like which one of those would potentially be better for the average entrepreneur? Okay. So sorry with the basic of life insurance you have, Term life, you have whole life, right? Term life is like renting an apartment. You never own the apartment. You're just renting it for a certain amount of time. When that time is over, you can choose to bail or the landlord can choose to say, I don't want to renew. With term life insurance, it's the exact same. You can choose, I don't want to renew it because I've outlived the need for that particular policy. Or the insurance company can say, hey, since that you got your policy, you've developed diabetes or cancer or lupus or something. And they can choose not to renew your policy. So it's a finite amount of time that you have a policy, which is only 10, 20, 30 years, and your amount stays the same. Just like with your apartment, however, when it's time to renew your lease, the landlord said, hey, I'm raising the rent by $20, right? So with your life insurance term policy, the insurance company says, hey, you're 20 years older now. You're 30 years older now. So they raise the premium. So now you're pretty same amount of coverage, same apartment, but now it just costs more money. Whole life insurance is like owning a home. When you get your home and you sign that mortgage dot, your mortgage is the same for the next 30 years. It doesn't change until you pay it off, right? And you get to stay in that home. When you have whole life insurance, you have the, the life insurance for your whole life. The premium never goes up. It stays the same. No matter what you get, lupus, cancer, uh, I don't know, whatever, any disease, the premium stays the same. It never increases. It's for your entire life. With an apartment, you have no equity in where you stay. The value of the property go up doesn't benefit you one bit. Same thing with term. There's no cash buildup. There's no value for you there unless you pass away. With whole life insurance, just like your home, you build equity in your home. In whole life insurance, You have a cash value account where you do have cash building up or you do have equity inside of that policy. So not only do you have the death benefit that is for your loved one when you pass away, 
but you're now accumulating some cash that you can actually tap into and take advantage of while you're alive. So those are the two founders. From that, there's an offspring of the universal life policy. The universal life policy was created because they said, yeah, the, the whole life policy, it has a guaranteed rate of 4%, but the market is doing 8, 9, and 10. So let's give people an opportunity to benefit from that. So they came out with the universal life policy that would allow you to um, kind of mimic the market a bit. And so when the market went up, the value in your account would go up as well. The problem was when the market went down, so did the value of your policy or the, the account inside of your policy. It was a variable yep. rate life insurance policy, basically. Yes. And those begin to blow up. You don't hear about those being promoted much anymore because they begin to implode because of the market. And so now what you hear a lot about is IUL, Index Universal Life. And so with the Index Universal Life, what that does is very similar to the Universal Life is it mimics the market. But they structured this policy such that you never have a downside. You have what they call a zero floor or zero is your friend. So when the market goes up, your account goes up. When the market goes down, your account stays right where it was. So it's like getting on an elevator. You ride it to the second floor. It goes down to one. You stay on the second floor until the elevator comes back up to two. And then you can ride it up some more. When the elevator goes down, you just get off the elevator. It goes down. The stock market can go down. When the market begins to come back up, you get back on and you ride it. So an IUL policy, no downside in terms of market risk, all upside. Okay? That is a great policy for a long-term retirement strategy. It is not an ideal policy for the infinite banking concept. And there's that, that that's really going into the nuts and bolts. But there, I like both policies and I see a benefit and a purpose for both of them. Unfortunately, I do see people promoting the IUL policy for the infinite banking concept. And it's really not designed for that purpose. Yeah. So, so the so the cash value that accumulates over time in the policy is what you borrow against now. Um, in the example that you used previous to that, and let's say you wanted to buy a car, so you take out the twenty five thousand dollars. But actually, what you're doing is borrowing against that. Is that is that how it works, or do I misunderstand that? So uh, you're actually borrowing. It's not even the money you're borrowing. Your money stays in the bank. Your money is held as kind of like collateral, and yeah. the, the the insurance company is loaning you the money. Okay. Now, when the insurance company loans you the money, that's how your money stays in your account and continue to earn the the interest and the dividend. Now you have an option to pay the money back or not pay the money back. Imagine that you take a loan and you have an option not to pay it back. I mean, how sweet is that, right? Because if you never pay it back, when you pass away, the family will get the benefit minus what you borrow. So now I have control over how quickly and what my monthly payment is on that car as opposed to letting Chase or Capital Finance decide what my monthly payment is, I can decide what my monthly payment is. And you can, if you want, I, I, this is just, for, again, from what I've heard, you, mm -hmm. when you set up the terms of that loan, you can mm -hmm. choose no interest, or you can choose to add a little bit of interest to it, which I think might uh, be a third way that that cash value account continues to accrue uh, value. Because you're not just collecting the insurance from the account, the dividends from the account, but you're collecting your interest from when you're making that payment back. Is that still, is that true or was I misunderstood there? No, that, that, that is true. You are paying interest. The only thing is, it's not an option to pay the interest. You definitely will. When you take the loan, there's definitely an interest that, you know, attributed to that money. Right. But when you pay it back, you are paying it back to yourself. So, you know, instead of paying that interest to a finance company, you're paying that interest back to yourself. Back to and what I like to highlight for my clients is when you buy a car and finance it traditionally, at the end of the five years when you pay the car off, you have a car, but you have no money. All the money is gone. How great would it be after five years or three years or however time, time frame you decide to have the car and the money? 
<laughs> right? To think about that. I borrow the money from myself. I pay myself back and I still have the car. So I have the car and the money. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to get into a nitty gritty here because I'm the kind of person that you can, if I was sitting in front of you and I said, Milton, help me out. I'm broke. I want to make a rich. Right? Yeah. And I'm, you can, you can throw these terms. You can explain the policy, how it works to me. And I'd be like, no, I totally trust you. That's cool. How does the company make money? Right? Like that's, that's how my brain works. Like if yes. they're offering this to me, nobody's doing this out of charity. Nobody cares about me. They're not doing this out of goodwill. They're making money off me. So how are they doing that? Now, from my understanding, and I'm totally okay with this. I think everyone should make money, but mm -hmm. an insurance policy they don't care about paying you out because they basically take your money, invest it in their stocks. They play the money game. They do the big Wall Street and they're making money off your principal. So paying off your principal when you die is like chum change to them because they've tripled, quadrupled your money so many times by them making the big boy moves. Like, am I wrong on that? Like, is that how the money game works when it comes to like insurance? Partially, right? Partially, that is true. They take our premiums. And they invest in, invest them, but they have to invest them into safe vehicle. They're not just going out here, you know, rolling, betting on, you know, Amazon, hoping that it goes up. They have to invest in safe bonds and, and some other investments that they invest in. But I'll tell you where insurance companies make the most of their money. Remember I said you buy term insurance and if you don't die, game over, no harm, no foul. Less than 2% of term policies pay out. Wow. Less than 2%. Gosh. So all of the term policies that are out here right around and people paying these premiums, and when the term is up, the insurance company won. They got all that money, and what did it cost them? Nothing. They got, they, they, it cost them zero. They just made a promise to you, hey, man. I know you're 28 years old. I know you're 30 years old and you're working out and you're healthy and you're trying to live the best, you know, in, as long as you can. So now you're helping me, right? You're trying to not to die. I appreciate that. Thank you. And so you live and the term is up. It costs me nothing. I got all the premiums. Okay. So I, I think that that's an important thing to know because this is what I came to realization when I was doing my courses and getting my license. Is that, for people, let's just say, broke Mitch, I want some sort of life policy. Mm -hmm. I can't necessarily afford the premiums of a whole life because they are a, a higher premium up front. On the Mac end, there it is actually cheaper than a term insurance. So it kind of mm -hmm. averages out. But on a term insurance, for me being 35 in pretty good shape uh, mm -hmm. with no health issues, I can get term insurance pretty cheap and dirt over my butt, yeah. right? Yeah. But when it goes up, I have to hope that I can afford a whole life because I can't get term insurance when I'm 60. I have to go to something different, which is extremely expensive. So it's like that higher average that balances out or that upfront self, you know, gratification or the only affordable option that you have. Like, is that, is that what you're seeing where people are almost like forced into term insurance because they can't afford the policies on bigger ones? So for yourself, when you described your situation, you did not tell me you had any dependents wife or children. It's just Mitch, right? And so Mitch doesn't need a million dollar policy. Mitch doesn't need a half a million dollar policy because Mitch doesn't have any financial responsibilities or liability. When Mitch passes, it's going to be emotional law. So I would tell you Mitch, what we need to do for you, Mitch, what we need to do for you is we need to get you the most whole life we can afford. It may be a $25,000 policy. That's all we need, right? Because it's just you. Then you say, okay, no, I'm getting married next year and we're going to have two kids. Now, Mitch, you need about a million dollars. Well, we got the 25 whole life, but we need to go get you a term policy, bro. We got to take care of that wife and kids in case you're not here. See, there's a place for both of those policies. It's not an either or. It's their both and. If you have the cash and can do whole life, best out of the two, it's best all day. However, if your current situation says, I need protection because I have someone counting on me, then we have to go turn. 
and get as much as we can because of that responsibility. But for you, 35 years old, no wife, no kids, just you, Mitch, what's the budget? We're going to buy as much whole life as we possibly can. I like it. And you know what's cool about that too is just how the whole life over time becomes the asset where uh, the other one is um, a tool or a bridge in terms of and, and and the creativity in in the way that you just solved that problem i think is i just i have to point that out really quickly like that's why you belong where you belong and why you are so good at what you do because <laughs> you really you really do understand this stuff i don't think i've i've talked to a lot of guys about this kind of stuff and i don't think i've ever had somebody make it that clear and what's interesting about it is, is maybe it's because a lot of the work that gets done in this uh, industry is is sales based, right? Really, just let's yeah. close some deals and get the thing done. And uh, yeah. maybe that comes from scarcity, and maybe you're in abundance, or maybe it's because we're on an interview and you really do want to prove your authority in the space. And uh, <laughs> in, in any event, I think that that's that's really important for people to understand about about this stuff. It is tough. It is tough because we are all present to the to the fact that a lot of it is a scam. A lot of it is people taking advantage of people and. Just like imagine how much data an insurance company has after being around for a hundred years and for every single human being that has ever purchased a life insurance policy, they have all your medical records, they have all of your financial history, they know who, exactly who you are and if and if you and your parents or somebody else you're related to, they connect this whole entire web and so they're not yeah. making a, they're not gambling. It isn't, they're not taking a shot on the chance that you might survive. They know absolutely without a shadow of a doubt how much you need to pay and what it's going to cost them on the other side. And I think having transparency in all of that is really important so that when somebody does decide to enter this space of like, okay, I'm ready. I need to make the plans. I need to make the moves. Mm -hmm. Um, They're armed or at least prepared to deal with uh, what, what's to come right what's going on in all of this um that being said milton what are some what are some mistakes what are some things that people really should be avoiding in in terms of you know when it comes to this kind of thing i think one of the mistakes that people make is trying to do it on their own right unfortunately i must say in my industry there are a lot of shysters bro a lot of scammer people who just you know, selling the highest commission product that they have. It may even be the best thing for you, but it's going to get me the higher commission. Mm. One of the things with um, infinite banking is that a properly structured policy pays me less commission. Now, let me quickly break that down to you guys so you understand how that works. If you have $100 and you buy a regular life insurance policy, That entire $100 goes towards the premium for life insurance, okay? And then that $100 buys you a certain amount of life insurance. I get paid a commission on the $100 times 12 months, $1,200, right? I get paid off that $1,200, whether it's 80%, 100%, depending on the contract. When you have an infinite banking policy, we turn the policy upside down. The focus is not on life insurance. The focus is on your your cash value account. So we buy the least amount of insurance possible in order to make it, you know, work the policy work. So out of that hundred dollars, maybe 30 bucks goes towards life insurance and 70 bucks goes towards your account. I only get paid on the $30 that buys life insurance. Mm. So instead of getting paid off of twelve hundred dollars, I'm getting paid off of three hundred and sixty dollars. But that's a better scenario for you. But many people in my industry said, I'm leaving money on the table. I'm not doing that. Mm. Right? And so unfortunately, many people don't know any better and they're getting the wrong kind of advisors. Right? They're getting people who are just out to make a quick buck. Because, I mean, full disclosure, you can make a really good living in the financial services space. But you have to take care of people if you want longevity. And so um, that's what I make sure that I do. I make sure that I do what's best for the client because not only do I want to be able to sleep at night, but I also get referrals when I take care of you, right? I also get invited to the family barbecue when I take care of you, right? And, you know, I just want to make sure that 
those are the things that are forefront and not just me making, you know, some cash. So to, to your point of what should someone do, first and foremost, get you an advisor, do some homework, some research, and just kind of like what we're having now, have a conversation to see how your advisor really thinks. You know, is he trying to find the market? You know, and, you know, the market's going down pretty young. But, you know, Amazon's coming out with this, and I, I expect that the market's going to shoot up. All that speculation. I hate when people talk about what the market's going to do. Get out of here. We have no idea what this market is going to do. Are you serious? You know, if you, if you put your money in this account right here, in 10 years, you're going to have. Are you serious? Since when can you predict what's going to happen 10 years from now? Hmm. You know, so I, I, I despise that kind of advising. I, I, I focus on what's controllable and what can we, you know, can do right now to, to hedge our bets and make sure that worst case scenario, you're going to be okay. 45 minutes on this episode was three months in a multi-level marketing <laughs> training campaign. So I think, I think this is a, a nugget of gold here because, uh, yeah, I think just breaking it down and, and putting it simple. And that's something that me and Devin have always tried to aspire to is how do we take big, complicated things, machines, and how do we break it down so that anyone can listen to it and being like, hey, I feel well more informed. I feel like I'm actually equipped, you know, to move forward. And so I don't know, that's my piece on this. I think that was a beautiful, beautiful explanation. So I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, well, well done, Milton. I, um, we're kind of coming up to the end of the hour here. And I just want to let you know, like how, how grateful we are with, uh, how gracious you've been with your time and, and, and knowledge and what you, what you've shared in terms of your experience. I think that that's, uh, priceless, especially for the people that are listening to this, including the entrepreneurs. I, I, I know that we, we have an entrepreneurial focus, but the, um, life insurance applies to everybody. And mm -hmm. so this, this is something that's going to, I think have a much broader reach in terms of who it's going to serve. Um, but if you are, if you are an entrepreneur, imagine what it would be like, um, you know, you you start your business, you've been running it for a while, you're five years in and, uh, you know, shit hits the fan and you gotta, you gotta scramble to make some things happen and pull some money together. Uh, or maybe you, you have a, a breakthrough and you want to, you know, go make a pitch. Well, rather than going to the dragon stand or the shark tank to try to get somebody else's money, imagine if you had that whole life policy kind of sitting there already that you could tap into that would help you get that extra staff or buy that extra piece of machinery or whatever the next move is for your business. Um, and if you plant that seed today, five, 10 years down the road, it's that tree is going to be bearing fruit for you when you need it the most. And so I think that that would be the, um, the, the best way to kind of sum up this whole entire conversation is you've got to find somebody to talk to them. I'm going to make the recommendation that Milton E. Brown Jr. is the guy that you call. Um, mm -hmm. If they do want to reach out to you, Milton, what's the best way for people to do that? Well, you can reach out to me definitely uh, on my mobile device, my cell phone, 773-936-5331. You can also check me out on Instagram. I know people love social media, so I can go to my IG at Cheerian, that's C-E-R-I-A-N, Consulting. Uh, that is also my LinkedIn, Cheerian Consulting. And um, I'm working on it in my YouTube channel right now, so that's not up. But, you know, just feel free to reach out to me. And even if you just have some questions, you want more clarification. I'm a patient guy. I play the long game, right? I'm not trying to pay my rent or my mortgage off of meeting with you today. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate and best. I'm, I'm fine. I want to make sure that when I get a client, it's not just a client, but it's a relationship that I'm building long term. The compliment to me is when your children decide that they want to continue to have me as your, as their advisor. That means that I really did my job. You know, I see a lot of um, transitioning now when, when the parents pass away and I say, hey man, you know, I'm sorry to hear that your client passed away. What did the kids decide to do? Well, they went with someone else. I don't say anything, but to me, it's kind of like, mm, there's something missing there that the kids decided to go somewhere else instead of sticking with you. So I'm looking to build relationships that last generation, well, at least my lifetime. And uh, I do that by doing what's best for my client. That's a hell of a goal, Milton. I like it. Yeah. Love it. Uh, that's it for this episode. We're going to link everything uh, that Milton just shared in the in the show notes um, or the description on YouTube. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, it's email theperspective at gmail.com or you can check out theperspectivepodcast.ca. Uh, otherwise, that's it for this episode and we will see you in the next one. <laughs>